uh, Catherine. Uh, I am the director of the Institute and wanted to let you know about a few things we have coming up. Uh, on December 15th will be our next forum at noon. Uh, I think we'll be talking about uh, infrastructure uh, funding. Uh, we'll then also have a legislative staff training on January 7th, starting at 9 a.m. Uh, and then uh, looking ahead, uh, we'll have a Michigan Political Leadership Program event with Frank Luntz uh, on April 20th. And you can sign up for all of those uh, at ippsr.msu.edu. Uh, we're also pleased to have new uh, co-chairs uh, for the Michigan Political Leadership Program, uh, Rudy Hobbs and Tanya Shootmaker. And uh, we thank uh, uh, Steve Tabachman and Susie Avery for their long service uh, to the state uh, and uh, the Michigan Political Leadership uh, Program. So thanks for your uh, support for IPSER. And uh, to get started, I'm gonna turn it over to our Associate Director, Arnold Weinfeld. Thanks, Matt, and thanks and welcome everyone to today's forum. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, all attendees are muted. And so if you have a question for our panelists, please put it in the Q&A box and uh, we will answer it uh, either after their presentation or uh, at uh, the end of both presentations. But again, all attendees are muted. And so please put those questions in the Q&A box. I have the pleasure today of introducing our speakers, uh, Dr. Catherine Strunk, is Professor of Education Policy and by Courtesy Economics and the Faculty Director of the Michigan State University Education Policy Innovation Collaborative. Uh, her current research through EPIC is focused on working with local and state education agencies on studies that will help them inform policy and practice. Uh, following Dr. Strunk will be Dr. Jacqueline Gardner, who is Director of Data and Evaluation in the Office of K-12 Outreach at Michigan State University. In this position, Dr. Gardner supports the data needs of Michigan schools and districts, especially specifically focusing on navigating the state of Michigan accountability requirements and student assessment data. And with that, I believe Dr. Strunk is up first. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you, and I'm gonna share my screen. You guys all see that? Yep. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Arnold and Matt, for having us today. So I'm gonna talk today about what we do know about Michigan K-12 learning, specifically K through eighth grade learning um, during the pandemic year of 2021. I had hoped one at a time when Matt and Arnold asked me to do this presentation, I would be able to say in the now that we're post pandemic, but clearly schools are still being highly affected by the pandemic uh, this year as well. And so we will continue this study in partnership with the state as we go so that we can continue to understand how students are learning uh, during this, this time. Uh, so I should say at the outset, this work that I'm talking about today is all done in partnership with the state of Michigan. We are the, EPIC is the research partner to the state in terms of all education policy research. So what we do is we work with the state pretty closely to understand what they wanna learn and then we try to, to do that. Um, so I'm gonna, Today's quick agenda is, is pretty simple. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about uh, Michigan student growth on benchmark assessments during the 2021 school year. And then I'm gonna talk really briefly about overall performance on the M-STEP in 2021. And then I'll conclude with discussions around a, kind of a deep dive into the third grade ELA M-STEP in 2021, which has implications for retention under the RIBA grade three law. So we can sort of look at learning from a couple different ways. So why are we looking at benchmarks first? Well, as we all probably know in this, in this group, we did not have MSTEPs in, which is the standardized achievement test in Michigan for third through eighth graders in the spring of 2020. Um, the, state, the federal government gave everybody a waiver, all states a waiver since most schools were not operating in person and there was not a desire to bring students back into buildings in order to have them test. So we waived test scores in 20, tests in 2020, and we don't have a way then of understanding how students progress between 2019 and 2020 springs and between 2020 and 21 springs. Um, so Michigan's legislature required that all districts administer benchmark assessments to all students in K through eight in both the fall and the spring of the 2021 school year. And they were provided to require, to, they were provide, required, required to provide data from these assessments to the state by June 30th. 
Um, we in turn did not get the data until September, uh, late, late mid August, I guess, of 2021. And so this report was due by the legislature in on September 1st. So we are going to show kind of our initial results today, and then we are working currently on another report that will provide a little bit more detail, and that will be out in early January. The legislation for Return to Learn allowed districts to choose between four approved assessment criteria uh, providers, or they could pick another assessment that meets certain criteria. This is important, and you'll see why in a second, because we want to be able to talk generally about all students in Michigan, but that's actually very hard to do given the way that the testing rolled out uh, last year, and it's again rolled out again this year. 91% um, of Michigan districts did provide the state with some form of benchmark assessment data. We were only able to use about 74% of districts in our analysis because some districts used the other assessment providers or they made their own assessments up that we can't use in our, in our work. Um, some provided the data to the state in a way that we couldn't use uh, in merging with other districts. And so we are only able to have about three quarters of districts in our analysis and only about 61% of students. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, that's particularly important because when you look at the results I'm about to show you, we wanna make sure we caveat that students in our analysis are very different from the state population of K through eight students and they differ across the vendors. So the districts that use different vendors differ pretty substantially. Overall, low income black and special education students are broadly underrepresented in the analysis I'm gonna show you. <clears throat> the report required us to identify the number and the proportion of students in, in the state that are significantly behind grade level. This is also one point in the distribution of student achievement. So when that means is that I'm not showing you averages right now, or even students at the very top edge of the distribution. These are just the students who are really struggling by the, end of the, by the beginning and the end of the school year in 2021. So with all those caveats aside, I'm gonna just quickly give a little bit more detail on that. Um, while there are about a million K through eight students in the state, we have data for this analysis of about 591,000 of them or 61% of the total student enrollment in K through eight in the state. Um, if you look at that blue bar, the blue column below that, that's actually Catherine, showing your, you. Uh, excuse me, Catherine, your, your slides did not advance. Oh, huh, okay. Sorry about that. There we go. Weird, okay. I'm gonna, please Arnold, chime in again if that happens again. Um, if you look at the blue column, uh, you'll see that we only have, that the state overall has about two thirds or 62% of the students are classified as low income or economic disadvantage. We have about a fifth of our students are black and special, a fifth are special education. And then about 7% of students in Michigan overall are Hispanic or Latino and 5% are English learners. Then you can look at the analytic samples that we have from, each of the vendors going to, the, you know, from NWA, iReady, Star, and DRC, which are the four approved vendors in the state. And uh, we don't show it on this slide, but it should be clear uh, from the outset that for NWA, we had 60% of districts had um, offered the NWA. Uh, sorry, 6% of students were in districts that had the NWA. 13% of students were in districts that offered the iReady, and Detroit is the big district that offers iReady. 7% uh, of students were enrolled in districts that offered the STAR test, and only 1.5% of students in Michigan were in districts that offered DRC. So when we look at the test scores that we, I'm going to show you in a second, make sure that you keep that in mind. We have very small samples of the STAR and DRC tests. We have the most representative sample of NWA, although we still have a very strong underrepresentation of low-income students. And of um, and in the iReady, we have also uh, an underrepresentation of low income students, although not nearly as much, but we have many more black students and Latino students in that sample than the average across the state. And then our star and DRC populations are broadly much wealthier and much whiter than the overall population. Okay, so one more piece of caveat before I get into the data. Um, every assessment that was used asked a different question, right? And so when we interpret them, we can't merge all the vendors together and just talk about overall across the state. We have to look across different vendors. And the reason for that is you can see here. So for NWA and MAP growth, we asked them to tell us, how would you tell us to define significantly behind grade level? And they said, well, we think that that should be what we project to be not proficient at the end of the year on the M step. So what that means is that the fall NWA MAPS test tell us what proportion of students at that time in the year, relative to where they should be at that time in the year, are, um, are not, would be not proficient on the MSTEP. For the curriculum and associates and I, the iReady group, we asked them and they said, well, actually you should look at this as performing two or more grade levels below their actual grade of where they should be at the end of the year. 
Um, Renaissance Star told us performing below grade level expectations and a need of intervention, which is the bottom quartile basically of students. And um, Smarter Balance gave, gave us yet a different definition. And so this has major implications for how we are able to interpret the data. And I'll walk you through that as we go. OK. So here's our first results table. Um, this is for NWA map. This is for um, the 2021 school year again. The green table shows you the fall 2020 test, a proportion of students who scored significantly behind grade level, which again for NWA means students that were projected to score not proficient at the on the M step based on where they were at that point. And then the spring as well. So what we see here is that if we look, let's look at third grade for math, which is that top column here, the top panel here. At the beginning of the year, about 35% of third graders were expected to be not proficient at the end of the year on the, on the map growth, uh, map, mathematics growth score. That increased to 39% by the end of the year. That's really important um, because it's an increase of 4% and you would expect normally to see a decrease, right? We'd normally expect to see that fewer students were expected to score below grade uh, uh, the not proficient level over the course of the year. Um, we did put up next to it the statewide M-STEP scores from 2019 and 2021. Big caveat I'll talk through in a second about 2021 is that, again, only about 70% of kids tested, and it was a very skewed sample. And so let's focus on 2019. And what you can see is that by the end of the year, 39% um, of, of third graders in math on the NWA test were expected to score not proficient on the M-STEP in a normal year. Um, that would have been 28% in 2019. So that tells us that there's, you know, probably a pretty large gap between where we would have expected third graders to be and where they ended up being. So they did learn. A lot of students made adequate progress over the course of the year, but the proportion of kids that are really struggling did grow and grew at much higher rates than in a typical school year. And you can see that is consistent across both math and reading um, and in, for, the, for all the students across the grades. Again, I'll just pull out one more. You can see that in eighth grade reading, for instance, about 22% of kids were expected to perform not proficient on the M-STEP as of the fall. That increased to 30% in the spring, which is an increase of eight percentage points. This is compared to 22% of kids who actually scored at the not proficient level in 2019 on the eighth grade reading M-STEP. So let's look at iReady next. Again, this is a smaller sample and it actually oversamples uh, African-American and Latino students. This is again, largely driven by Detroit. And again, we see that students made slower, pro slower progress this year than we would have expected in a traditional year, um, but they did make progress. For iReady, they did provide us with their sample of Michigan students from the 2018-19 school year. So we could compare against that. It is not an equivalent sample to the folks who took it in 2021, but it gives us kind of a touch point to know what we should have expected. Um, and here you see that I'm going to take again third grade math, but at the beginning of the year, 40% of third grade um, students who took the curriculum I ready, curriculum I ready math test were expected to score about two grade levels or more behind um, with an adequate and normal grade level would be by that point. We expect this um, to, so in the NWA we saw increases, here we see decreases, and this got, went down to 25%, which is what we would expect to go down. We would expect fewer students to be performing uh, at this level below grade level over the course of the year. So the question is, what's the change? And so here you see for third grade math, about 15 percentage point difference between fall and spring. If you go over to the blue columns on the, to the right, you see in a 2018-19 of the students who took the iReady test, that was a drop of 26 percentage points. And only 14% of those students were performing two or more grade levels behind in third grade math by the end of the 2018-19 school year. So again, we see much less growth than we would normally expect based on the iReady results. This is again consistent across grade levels. Um, you can see for reading, it seems to be uh, a, substantially worse for the early grades, which is always a concern that we're thinking about in, in Michigan as we really focus on literacy moving forward. Okay, I'm gonna just do these ones um, pretty quickly because these are again, very small samples, but here's our um, DRC, sorry, here's our STAR 360 test. And again, what they said is they're norming against across the country pre-COVID, basically the bottom quartile of students. 
And again, we can see that on average, fall performance was lower than in pre-COVID national norm. Uh, K-5 students' relative performance improved, improved from fall to spring. So that was a, a kind of a shining spot. But again, these are a much whiter and much wealthier population than the rest of the state. And here we go with the DRC. Again, these are very, very few students in the thousands that took this test. Um, and we can see that compared to other grade levels on the DRC, te the DRC tests, um, third and fourth grade students were the most likely to be behind in the fall, but they did make the most progress from fall to spring. Okay, so the main takeaways here, I think are, are sort of important to consider. Um, while students did learn over the course of the year, and I wanna make that really clear, it wasn't that students learned nothing last year and that some students didn't gain quite a bit, but while students did learn over the course of the 2021 school year, that rate of learning appeared to be slower than in a typical pre-pandemic school year and substantially for some grades and subjects and in some districts. And in particular, this bottom set of students, the students who are really struggling that were significantly behind grade level, um, didn't go down and oftentimes actually increased more than we would have expected. Um, students who are not white, who are low income and who are eligible for special education, we're less likely to be in our data set. And we know that from the other uh, work across the country and from the work that we're developing right now, that the pandemic had more negative effects on exactly those students. So that suggests to us that what we're seeing here might actually be an overestimate of growth in the 2021 school year. Um, and we will need to kind of really understand more as the years go on to see exactly how much they've been struggling this year. Um, so, okay, now let's quickly talk about the M steps because I wanna make sure we give Jacqueline a lot of time. Um, and this is, from the, um, this is from the MDE data, so I won't go into it that much. Uh, MDE has not yet released their full uh, data from the, from, or they haven't, I don't have their full data yet from, from M steps at the individual level. So we haven't been able to work with it that much. But just remember, as a reminder, um, we did not have, uniform testing in the spring of 2021. So the federal government did waive the participation requirement for the M steps and for every state across the country. And so while normally we would have over well over a 95% participation rate in the M steps, this year we only had about a 70% participation rate in the M steps for ELA and math across grade levels. And this participation rate varied really widely across districts and even within districts across schools. So it makes it very difficult to compare um, performance over time at all, or even across districts and schools. So what do we see from the M steps? This is just a very simple table that shows you for grades three through seven, what the proficient or above uh, proportions were in ELA and math in 2019, those are in the white rows, and what the 2021 proficient or above rates were in, uh, 20, in ELA and math in the blue rows. And you can see that Slightly fewer lower proportions of students scored proficient or above in all grade levels, basically, um, across both subjects in 2021 relative to 2019. But again, the students that took this test were very different from the overall populations. These are, again, likely overestimates of how students did across grade levels and subjects. Okay, now let's dive into third grade, because this is the data that we've been able to work with most closely. And so we have a lot more to say on this. And we think this is probably representative of uh, the rest of the, of the grade levels in the state. Just a quick reminder on why I have the third grade data to this level. Under Michigan's Read by Grade 3 law, third grade students are subject to a set of outcomes based on their ELA M-STEP score. If they score high enough, which is a 1272 or above, based on um, a lot of sort of level setting that MD has done pre-pandemic, they get promoted to fourth grade without question. If they're between a 1253 and a 1271, they can be promoted to fourth grade, but they're supposed to have extra reading supports while they get there. If they score below a 1252 or, or below, then they're eligible for retention. That does not mean they will be retained. They could get a good cause exemption, which we'll talk about in a second. But these are the kids who are really struggling. They're substantially below grade level, but such that under the law, they're eligible for retention. If you don't take the test though, you don't have an M-STEP score and therefore you're not subject to the Rubik grade three law retention policy. This was supposed to start in 2020, but given that M-STEPs were waived, the first time that retention was on the table was 2021. Um, what are the good cause exemptions? Why wouldn't kids get retained? So there's a couple things in the law. If they're English language learners, if they have an IEP or a section 504 plan, so they're students with a disability. 
if they've been retained before and have received reading interventions in the past, um, if they've been highly mobile, if they've been able to demonstrate proficiency another way, and if your parent requests it with the superintendent's approval. So those are all reasons that kids might not be retained. So again, like the benchmark tests, you can see that we had very different participation rates, uh, very different kinds of kids participate. Uh, and this blue table on the right, you can see that in 2021, we only had 71% of third graders participating in the test, and it was many fewer Black or African-American students. So 43% of Black or African-American students participated in the 2021 third grade ELA assessment relative to almost 95% in 2019. Um, similarly, we had, fewer Asian, uh, uh, we had fewer Asian students, fewer American Indian or Alaska Native students, fewer Hispanic or Latino students. Um, the, the smallest difference was for white students. Um, and so that's, I think, a really key thing. On the bottom two rows, you can see in the top quartile of districts, you know, the districts who were performing the best pre-pandemic, 81% of students took it relative to only 36% of districts in the, in the districts that were performing the worst before the pandemic. In that green uh, box to the left, you can see this by modality. So what, what teacher, what, sorry, how schools were operating by May, 2021. And so you can see that in districts that were fully in person, um, and they were only offering in-person education, about 87% of kids took the test relative to about 80% that were only offering hybrid and only about 22% of kids um, who took the test in districts that were still fully remote only in May of 2021. So let's talk about some of the results. On that left bar, you can see that about 4.8% of students scored at 1252 or below, which means that they were highly struggling with reading and they were eligible for retention. That's that green bar. So 4.8% of students who took the test. If you account for what we think are all the good cause exemptions that might be out there, it would shrink to about 2.2% of students who took the test would have been um, retained. Uh, you can see that it's not so different for females and males, but the difference between not economically disadvantaged and economically disadvantaged students is pretty big, as well as for students with disabilities and ELs which suggests that the, uh, the low-income students, the students with disabilities, and the English learners were the really struggling the most in third grade literacy by the end of the school year. Here we break it down by race and ethnicity of students. And what I think is pretty obvious here is this sort of big bar for African-American or Black students. So 13% of tested African-American or Black students on the 2021 ELA MSTEP in third grade scored at a 1252 or below, signifying that they're very much struggling with, um, with literacy. This was, you know, you can see only 2.7% for Asian and 3.3% for white. So the disparity is quite large. Latino and Hispanic are about 6.6% .6 of students were struggling to that extent with literacy in third grade. Here we go um, by uh, modality. Uh, you can see this fully remote bar, that's about 16% of kids in remote districts who took the test, and remember that very few of them did, were struggling with literacy relative to only about 4.7% for districts that were fully in person or 4% that had the option of being in person. What's striking to me about this slide is that it's almost a linear function going up, right? And so uh, the more in person we were in schools of the kids who tested, the least likely they were to be struggling in third grade literacy to the point where they're flagged for retention. Um, and so I think that tells us something that we've been seeing nationally about how important it is for kids to be back in, in instruction in person. Okay, and then here we just break it down by district type. And what you can see here is um, difference between charter schools, which are PSAs and traditional public schools, partnership schools, which are the state's turnaround districts, uh, turnaround schools, and again, these top and low performers districts pre-pandemic, and the gaps are just huge. Um, I'm not going to present today. I had some slides ready, but I'm not going to present about who was actually retained. You can look at the slides that are going to be posted, I believe, or there's reports online, but I want to make sure we give Jacqueline enough time. But I want to just quickly talk about some main takeaways here. So again, students made progress, but much slower than in a typical school year. Um, given the differences in the kinds of kids who took the tests, we know that these are probably overestimates of student learning gains. Uh, I think that the third grade ELA MSTEP scores really that we just walked through really show us the extent to which there are inequities in this. So it's the kinds of kids that were really struggling before the pandemic 
that have been most impacted by the pandemic and have learned, have, their rates of learning have been the slowest during the pandemic. So this tells us that this is a really critical time to think about learning recovery, which we all know. Um, and it's not just gonna be this year, it's gonna be extended. You can't make up these kinds of gaps in just a year. So we have to pay a special attention to the kids who were most impacted by the pandemic and think about how we're gonna provide them with the resources and acceleration to help them become, to help them catch up to their peers and have helped the whole state sort of recover from what has inevitably been a very tough year and likely a second tough year this year. So with that, I will end it and I will be happy to take questions at the end after Jacqueline. You're muted, Arnold. Of course I am, naturally. Uh, we, we've had a couple of questions from one person I think we can take right now. Um, Beth Moore asks, why do districts choose different vendors? And do you have the rural or urban distribution of the vendors? We do have rural and urban. I can't recall what it is off the top of my head. If it's not in the report, feel free to email me and I will happily send that your way. Um, districts choose different vendors based on what they think best fits their curriculum, what they feel, you know, is best for their kids. Um, we don't really have a lot of understanding of that. Many states have one contract with a single vendor. Uh, Michigan is, a, you all know, a very local control state, so we don't have that. Um, it would be much easier for us to understand progress over time if we did have that. Um, what we're hoping is that the legislation that does require benchmarks to have happen this year and next year has asked districts to stick with the same vendor. And so we're hoping that we can see the progress over time, at least within vendor. Super. Uh, a couple of general questions have come through. Yes, you will, attendees will be receiving the slideshow and it will be posted on our IPSR website as well. And EPIC stands for Educational Education Policy Innovation Collaborative. So, Thank you, Cindy, for putting that link in the chat. Yeah. Uh, one more question maybe from uh, Bill Drake and Senator Paul Boino's office. What are partner schools? Uh, great question. Partnership schools are the state's uh, lowest performing, persistently lowest performing schools and districts. And so it's an intervention that was put into place years ago under the federal law, ESSA, to identify the lowest performing schools and make help them improve. So it's, in turn, it's called turnaround in other states. Here they're called partnership schools. Actually, EPIC has been studying these schools with partnership with the state for, we're in our fourth year now. There's a lot on our website about them and we're always happy to answer questions. Super. Thanks again, Catherine. And now we'll turn to uh, Dr. Jacqueline Gardner for her presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to quickly share my PowerPoint and get started here. Just give me one second. Okay. Uh, Again, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be here and grateful for the opportunity from IPSER to present on K-12 Outreach's white paper, which is about a um, process guide for spending COVID-19 relief dollars. Before I get started, I just have to say that this was a team effort. And while I'm sitting here being the face of the paper, there were tons of people behind the scenes, included those listed there on the very first slide. Um, especially Tyler and our, our student assistants and graduate students that are listed there. So huge thank you to them. And they definitely deserve all of the credit on this great uh, piece of work that we put together. Um, so Catherine just gave us a great overview of what student achievement looked like last year. And as we know, it was a really tough year, another tough year because of COVID. And while there was progress made, it wasn't made quite as great as we may have hoped here in Michigan. Um, as a result, the federal government did respond with a huge wave or multiple waves of COVID relief money. And that is essentially what our paper covers. It's, it talks about um, how districts might be able to spend their COVID relief money. Now, keep in mind, we are not advising what districts should spend on, but rather we are suggesting a decision-making guide for how districts might think about spending their money. Given the momentous occasion of the huge amount of funding that's coming through from the federal government, um, the decisions that districts make are going to be definitely scrutinized because there's hope that there's big turnaround 
based off of this huge investment. So districts, we are suggesting districts be very thoughtful and intentional with the money that they spend so that it does address the unique needs of each district rather than perhaps spending on something that is like the shiniest, the flashiest, newest program. Um, so we wanted to provide a decision-making guide and a roadmap so that we can minimize any mismatch between district selected measures from the money and the types of investments that Congress was hoping for based off of the pandemic's effects. Additionally, there are, there are and will be many vendors with some great resources that um, districts may be interested in. And we are encouraging districts to really make sure those, those resources, those services are exactly what the district needs. Um, we just, the main goal here is that the districts are able to spend their money really well and intentionally, and they're able to have a great impact on the lives of the students and the educators within the district. The other thing that I just want to note is K-12 outreach, we do a ton of work with um, different school districts. We do a lot of work with turnaround efforts and we don't know the local conditions of each school district. It is, those conditions have a great impact on what districts may or may not spend their money on. So this process guide urges districts to really take into consideration local conditions, local needs, and to genuinely engage all of those stakeholders. So these funds are not going to be a panacea um, for educational change, but they may start moving the needle in the right direction. And I'm gonna briefly review the funds in this presentation, and then I'm going to dive into our process guide. But just keep in mind that this, this is an opportunity to see federal money um, be spent on some really great district priorities and potentially make some really big impacts. Um, again, I mentioned this earlier, districts and schools must genuinely engage community members, not just educators, but also um, foundation members, external community members, staff, parents, teachers, all of those people that are contributing to the community so that they can make effective use of the federal funds and be ready to defend those, those investments that they do make. Now, I know that in this presentation, there are a number of people who are much better versed in the different ESSER funds that came through than I am. Our paper starts by providing um, an overview of the federal relief dollars given in the three waves of the ESSER money. And uh, there are links provided in our paper if you want to know more and have the direct resources about those funds. But the main takeaway um, from this slide is the federal government released billions, that's with a B, billions of dollars to education to help relieve the, the negative effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on education. And similarly, those funds were distributed to the states. And again, I'm gonna use the word billions. Michigan did get billions of dollars to spend on um, education relief efforts to distribute to local education authorities so that they can invest in different initiatives to help with recovery. This again is linked in our paper and uh, if you want more information on it, there are also links embedded within the paper. This is just a really brief uh, timeline overview of when the funds were awarded and when they need to be spent by. One of the unique things about these funds is that they are one-time funds, which means they are unlikely to be supplemented or extended in the future. With that in mind, um, when districts are thinking about how they might spend these one-time funds, we suggest uh, not using these funds for recurring costs, but think about it as an opportunity to invest in something that really might have a one-time big turnaround impact, just because those funds aren't going to be coming around again as of right now. Um, and like I said earlier, the one-time funds, what this means is they do come with an expiration date. This funding came in three waves and all three waves have different expiration dates, meaning the funds must be spent by a certain date. 
So given these unique parameters that we are, are operating under and uh, the time sensitiveness and the scrutiny that, that districts and education in general is going to be under, our office decided to come up with a funding decision-making model. Um, a quick note, this funding decision-making model is a model that can be applied in other areas like infrastructure. But today we're speaking specifically about education and the reason that we wanted to come up with this is, is to really drive home the point that local needs need to, be, need to be considered, community members need to be engaged, and um, the spending needs to be thoughtful and intentional based off of those local needs. So we came up with this funding decision-making model that can be used time and time again. I'm gonna go into it a little bit more, but the brief overview is it starts with a needs assessment, which many districts have done before, I know. The second step is matching needs to solutions. The third step is meeting ESSER requirements. The fourth step is strategic planning. And the final step is evaluation and accountability. One of the prerequisite steps to beginning a needs assessment is to identify the district's existing and desired states. So a district's existing state is it includes the present day conditions that students, educators, and experience or communities experience at their schools. So it's basically what is happening now. And then the desired state is, is what, what the district wants their state to be, um, a vision of what goes into effective schools. It's a condition of what should be in pie in the sky world for all students. So coming up with this vision is crucial and having all uh, stakeholders invested in the desired state is also crucial to take under a needs assessment so that a plan can be created and then implemented and hopefully with some impact. So the first step again is the needs assessment. Um, the first, as I mentioned, once the agreed upon desired state is uh, achieved, then the district should consider how a needs assessment can help get to the end goal. When you're considering this, the district should take into thought who is included in the process, what elements might be concluded, included, and how results might be communicated. Um, the next step is to collect and organize data from within the district and possibly even within the community to figure out what, what the current state looks like um, and to know what, what is going to be needed moving forward. So you have to cultivate an evidence-based understanding of the current state through data collection and analysis. The next step in the needs assessment is to interpret the information. And we suggest that when looking at all this information, you engage multiple stakeholders so they're part of the interpretation phase. After this interpretation happens, it's great to next determine the priorities of the district. So you can decide what is the most pressing, what needs to happen first, followed by what is next. The next step in the needs assessment is to um, plan action items, define steps, and think about an implementation plan. One other thing to think about when doing a needs assessment is to consider other district initiatives that are already taking place within the district and how a new initiative based off of the ESSER funding might work alongside the current initiatives. Are they, um, do they work well together? Are they in contrast to one another? So just make sure you're considering everything that's currently happening in the district before undertaking something new. Again, I know we're saying this a lot, is to genuinely engage the stakeholders. And that's because in our experience in K-12 outreach, we have seen situations where stakeholders have not fully been engaged and it does result in both tension and maybe not the impact that was intended. So when you're thinking about engaging all the stakeholders, consider using non-traditional means for input from stakeholders, such as social media, or using some sort of like survey monkey, Qualtrics-y sort of platform to get feedback. Um, 
Also think about engaging stakeholders beyond, the, beyond, beyond education and beyond the school building. So just think about all community members, go to a farmer's market to get input. There are, there are lots of venues to generate some input um, from different stakeholders. And finally, be creative with partners. And this one is specifically thinking about maybe foundations or funds in your community that may also have some resources or inputs or priorities and ideas that could be really beneficial to relationship building and determining how to spend um, some of the money. The second step in our decision-making process is to make sure that the needs of the district are matched to solutions and that the solutions are evidence-based. So um, MyKIP has some great resources for evidence-based solutions, which is actually where this chart is bothered from or borrowed from. And it's definitely in our paper if you wanna take a closer look. Again, it's not necessary to pick the shiniest uh, latest and greatest intervention. What is more important is to pick a solution that is evidence-based, that is high impact, high impact, and that actually meets a need that the district has. One more thing to say about this is while it's important to learn from districts who may be adjacent to you or similar to, to, you, to your district, keep in mind that each district has its own unique needs. So what one district is doing may or may not work for your district. Um, so that's why we're saying take an internal look at what the needs are of your district. This hexagon tool is another um, tool that we borrowed from MyKit because we think that it's a really great way to assess district readiness for solutions. The likelihood that an intervention can address an identified need uh, depends both on the proven effectiveness of the selected efforts and the district's readiness to implement. So this hexagon tool, again, created by MyKIP, it includes a framework for thinking about if the selected strategy is the right thing to do and if it can be done in the right way. These, um, these scales that you see, evidence, usability, supports, need, fit, capacity, replying to those with your district in mind helps answer, is this solution that we've identified a proven one? And do we as a district and a community have the right environment and setting to implement such a solution? Both of those things are crucial to the solution's success. So our step three in our decision-making guideline is to really consider the ESSER requirements and think about the legal environment around ESSER spending. And yes, while the ESSER funding has a ton of flexibility, there were both um, some intentions around what, the, what, the, uh, what Congress wanted this money to be spent towards, and also there are legal requirements surrounding those. So first and foremost, we recommend before you decide to commit to a given solution or an, an initiative, please, 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 pursue or consult with your district's legal counsel just to make sure it is not in violation of any of the regulations around ESSER spending. Some of the legislative priorities around ESSER spending include reversing student learning losses. That's a huge one that everybody is thinking about. Supporting marginalized population. Again, especially given the presentation that Catherine just gave. This is, I mean, couldn't be a bigger time to be supporting marginalized populations. Um, preventing additional disease spread, providing students with access to cutting edge technology, revitalizing student mental health. This is an, uh, while, while student mental health has always been important, we are seeing its impact greater, now greater than ever. So definitely that one. Um, and coordinating the efforts of educators with public health departments. So this is kind of my, our cautionary slide, um, identifying added requirements and external uh, regulations. So it, the legislation does allow for broad use of funds, but there are other regulations from other laws that need to be considered. In our paper, we have an appendix, Appendix A, that kind of goes through some of the priorities and some of the ideas that districts have been coming up with on how they might spend their money. Um, and it also includes what other laws or regulations they may be beholden to. 
Um, some of the following areas of spending are crucial to decision making, um, construction and renovation, school and extracurricular programs, equipment technology, technology and cybersecurity, sanitation and maintenance, food services, mental, social, and emotional wellness programs. So I'll just use an example for you. Um, if you look closely at the language in the ESSER funding, new construction, so building a brand new building, is highly discouraged. However, in our work, we have heard of a number of districts saying, oh, you know, maybe we'll build something new. Keep in mind that it's not only highly discouraged the brand new construction, but due to the time constraints around ESSER spending, meaning it has to be spent by a certain time, and how long it might take for a new construction, that could be a bit of a red flag. Additionally, when thinking about new construction, there's a whole slew of regulations that have to be follow followed. Now, alternatively, renovations and upgrades, which also fall under the, the construction um, arm, those are definitely encouraged, especially if they are related to sanitation and maintenance. So updating HVAC systems, installing hand sanitizer systems throughout the, the building, um, all of those air purifying systems, that is exactly one of the things that ESSER money, they, they're suggesting it be spent on. So a few of the other areas like school and extracurricular activities or, activity, or programs, those programs are also subject to requirements and external regulations, such as those that may have been set out in ESEA and IBEA and others. So I guess my caution is take a look at Appendix A and proceed with caution. Just make sure that um, you're following all of the regulations. And again, look, talking with legal counsel and incorporating them into the decision making is really important. So for strategic plan planning, um, it's important to, to keep in mind that districts may find that they have needs beyond what federal funds can support. Although there, there are going to be other parallel tracks of funding to address districts unmet needs, or perhaps there's a need that ESSER funding is not intended for, or perhaps there's a need you've identified that has to be recurring, and this one-time funding will help for it at the beginning, but districts might be wondering how they can plan for it in the future. There are other areas of funding that districts should consider to continue these initiatives, such as supplementary state grants, added federal grants and programs, local revenue generating options allowable, allowable under Proposal A, and supports from foundations and private entities. And additionally, with strategic planning, something that we want districts to be able to do is we don't want this to be a one and done opportunity. Yes, there's a lot of money to jumpstart things, but keeping an initiative going, especially one that has impact, has results, and is really making a difference requires strategic, strategic planning on the district's part so that it can be continued beyond the ESSER funding timeline. As districts are thinking about their desired state, they may want to reflect on questions such as what tasks and activities will be included now and in the future? What non-financial resources will be required? Who is going to oversee this? How will we encourage collaboration? With an understanding of unique local needs, which solutions could work best and what funds match each of the selected solutions, district leaders have to put all of this together to make sure or to help ensure that the district can reach their desired state and that it respects the interests of all relative stakeholders. The goal here is that there's lasting change, not just one-time change. Now in our office, something that I'm, I'm personally proud of and I think our office does a great job of is we, like, we love the evaluation arm of our work, meaning any programs that we try to implement either internally or with um, partners, we try to have a great evaluation plan in mind. And we do that so that we're able to make mid-course um, adjustments as we need to, and also to be responsive to feedback from all of the stakeholders. Um, when we do that, we have to define some success criteria. Now, this is in this environment that we're living in, um, success criteria in the education world is really interesting. 
test data is a little bit unstable just because we're seeing funky numbers of, of um, st students testing and maybe some non-random missing data, uh, meaning there may be patterns to those who are taking versus aren't taking both formative and summative tests. Um, I know that a lot of legislators and congressmen, they, um, they are hopeful to see changes in academic achievement. However, our office is encouraging districts to think about alternative um, measures of success, such as social emotional markers, other qualitative data from all stakeholders, especially students and teachers and educators, attendance data, behavior data. And one of the reasons that we are suggesting this is because everyone has been, has been impacted in one way or another by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we believe that there are interim steps between funding and student achievement, such as basic needs that need to be met. So if you're operating in a district that has some base, that has students with basic needs that need to be met, think about how you might define success criteria around basic needs rather than around student achievement, because student achievement is not going to, an, an improvement in student achievement is not going to happen if students' basic needs are not met. And some of the ESSER money, it is intended to feed students, for example, um, to help meet those basic needs. So in the evaluation, think creatively about some, uh, some success criteria that you can use to measure the program that you're going to implement. This is just one model of evaluation that our office has used to identify when and where we need to make mid-course adjustments. And also once we cycled through a, like a whole year of a program or whatever the timeline is, we're able to evaluate it. And then if we want to implement again or continue implementing, we can make changes based off of this evaluation model. Um, again, it's important to think about all stakeholders and what their investment in questions might be. Um, because their success criteria may look different than yours. So in conclusion, this funding moment presents a tremendous opportunity for districts to reconceptualize how they educate America's youth. It does raise the stakes. Um, and our office, this paper, is suggesting that thoughtful and systematic decision-making around utilizing relief dollars can minimize threats and positively impact students' lives. Thank you all for letting me present today. This is our office's contact information. Um, I appreciate everyone's time. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. I greatly appreciate your presentation as well. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. We've had one uh, pop up um, and that's regarding maybe your last discussion on oversight and accountability. Are there any actual measures in place uh, to ensure, for instance, that districts are including uh, the external stakeholders, or is, is it just a point that, that we're pressing? So that is a point that our office is, is pressing right now. Um, that would be a great question for local districts to see if they, I know that there are districts using tools, surveys, um, and others other methods to gather input from multiple stakeholders. So I encourage uh, the person who asked the question to maybe seek that out. I also see that there are, I, I know that public comment is part of the ESSER process and like putting your ESSER plans together, they have to be open to public comment. Um, our office is encouraging more than just receiving public comment because oftentimes a lot of people don't know like what's going on or they don't know that this funding is happening and that districts are supposed to be making these decisions. So we're encouraging districts to press even further to engage multiple stakeholders. The other thing I will say is in our paper, we, um, I think it's appendix B, there's a map of Michigan and it highlights a few districts that we've seen um, talk about how they're going to be using their ESSER spending. So I would take a look at that because they have already started publicly talking about spending their ESSER money and they may have some ideas and methods in place for collecting that sort of information. Yeah, and it's been noted that it's also in Michigan's ESSER application to the uh, federal government. So thank you for that. Catherine, if you could uh, turn on your camera, I've got a question for you regarding your 
uh, information. And I think as you noted, um, the information you presented is our findings that we're seeing uh, across the country. And so now that we have the facts that various populations fell further behind than others, and that generally speaking, uh, students in 2021 um, fell behind. Uh, are you exploring any initiatives or strategies that are being put in place to, quote, catch kids up? That's a great question. Um, we are doing some work on that in partnership with the state. The critical thing is really going to be data collection. So it is still unclear to us how much data are going to be collected in Michigan or really anywhere across the, across, across the country about the kinds of initiatives districts are putting into place. You can't study what you don't know is happening. Right. So what we really need is for districts to give us their data and to tell the state and to tell us we're doing these kinds of programs for these specific kids. And then we can assess, are these kids doing these programs actually achieving a greater rate than other kids? And then how do we replicate that across other districts? Um, if we don't have those data, it's gonna be a black box and I'm, I'm pretty worried about that. Yeah, and, and really we may not know, we're only gonna know over time, right? Until this cohort takes their next broader tests in terms of an M step or whatever that might be. Uh, uh, you know, to really figure out if they, if they are did get caught up. Yeah. So again, the legislature did require all districts to offer benchmark assessments uh, in this year and next year. So we should have test scores coming in pretty soon uh, from the fall, and then again in the spring. So we'll be watching those at least to see how students are doing on at least those assessments. But to Jacqueline's point, there are other critical outcomes too that we know we care about that are much harder to measure. Yeah. I greatly appreciated uh, your presentation, Jacqueline. I've been part of a team that's been talking to local units of government about uh, federal funding under the American Rescue Plan and, and mentioning some of the very same things you did as well in terms of talking to stakeholders and, uh, and making sure that you know, this money is put to its greatest and highest use. Um, uh, so, so, so greatly appreciated that. Um, uh, someone's asked uh, for the uh, white paper Jacqueline just presented on. Again, that'll be on our website. Maybe Jacqueline, you could put it in the uh, chat box there uh, as well. Um, so folks, folks can get that. Um, and let's see, we have another question that's popped up here. Uh, oh, here's a good one. <laughs> Uh, any creative ideas out there being shared with schools regarding the use of ESSER funding to help with staffing and staff shortages? Um, that is a, a huge issue that's being written about these days. Um, schools uh, across the state uh, having to go to a day, a one day remote or just one day off a week now because of staffing shortages. I know there's a huge shortage in the substitute teaching field as well. So any, any uh, thoughts about using ESSER funding to help with these issues? So I, I will respond, but please know that I am not the exact expert in this area. And I also saw the article in Bridge Magazine this morning, and this, this is a, a, it's a really big issue and it just breaks my heart. And I hope that we can help these help educators. There's a lot of issues here. Um, I have heard of a few districts offering some financial incentives to teachers. With that said, um, in my presentation, I noted that ESSER funds most of the time should not be spent on recurring costs such as salaries. Um, so while I think bonuses, there are opportunities there, think about using ESSER funds maybe for thinking of how to retain and recruit um, teachers rather than um, giving an increase. Uh, not the, teachers obviously deserve an increase in salary. So, so I'm like really he hesitant to say what I'm about to say. They definitely deserve more money. But with the ESSER funding, that may not be the best use of it because it's not sustainable in the long right. term. Right, then you're gonna have, then you're committed to it. I, I've, I've likened it to the uh, COPS program, for instance, that was made available to local communities years ago where uh, the federal government would fund for the hiring of more police officers, but it was only for about a three-year period. 
and local units had to understand that and be ready to commit to continue funding those police officers afterwards. So same thing here for school districts and even local units looking to uh, replace personnel that may have left uh, as a result of the pandemic. Great, great, great answer. Um, we're just after one o'clock. Uh, any more thoughts from you, Jacqueline or Catherine, moving forward? What, uh, what might we see from each of your uh, shops in terms of uh, information over the next six months, for instance? Sure, I'll go first, Jacqueline, and then maybe you follow on. Um, so for Epic, we'll be doing, again, we'll have a report coming out in January on the kind of more deeper dive on benchmark assessments, looking at scale scores. So kind of average uh, achievement and distribution across the across districts and assessment vendors, as well as breakdowns for concerns about equity. So different subgroups of kids and districts and how they did on the test last year. Um, then we'll have another report looking at growth over time with the 21-22 benchmark assessments as those become available. And then again, 22-23 in future years. So that'll be coming. Um, we also continue to think about teacher shortages with the state. So that's very important. And so we will have a report coming out in early January as well about what we can know from the data that currently exists in the state about the state of teacher shortages today, uh, as recently as we can get with the data. Thank you. Um, in our office, so one of our, our big wheelhouse is supporting districts in their turnaround efforts and providing coaching and support to districts throughout the state of Michigan. So we will continue to do that. We also have another white paper that just came out called COVID Keepers. Um, again, it's around some of the COVID practices that maybe are a positive thing. Like there's a lot to learn from COVID. So that just came out and some of my colleagues have worked really hard on that. We're also going to be revitalizing an accountability paper. And one of the other areas that we are, are desperately interested in and wanting to support districts in, in a, a practitioner sort of way is the, the teacher labor market, the, the teacher supply from teacher retainment and retention. So hopefully we'll have an opportunity to delve into that area and would obviously love to work with Catherine always on anything related to that. Well, I wanna thank the both of you uh, for taking time today to present and thank you both also for all the work that you do to help inform the conversation and uh, policy and decision makers as they move forward trying to address these issues. A uh, great example of how uh, our faculty and staff here at Michigan State University are, are working to make a difference. Uh, just wanna remind folks about the evaluation. We greatly appreciate uh, you filling that out. Um, it's uh, been posted in the chat and we'll probably be sending it to all those who attended as well. Uh, Matt, you have any final words before we close the session? No, just join us next time on December 15th for our next forum and uh, let us know if we can do anything to help. And thanks to all the presenters. Have a good day. Thank you. And everyone have a good Thanksgiving.